Let's pray together. Father, as we turn to you this morning, we turn to your word. Thankful for who you are. Thankful for what you've done. And thankful that we can gather. So we thank you for the riches in Romans that we get to explore this morning. We thank you for the privilege of gathering and for the blessing of being your people. And gathering is your church. And we thank you for this opportunity now and pray your blessing on our time in Jesus' name. Amen. You can go ahead and take out the passage, Romans 8, 31 through 39, the insert in your bulletin. That'll be our, our text for this morning. We'll look at that together. But if your mind is anything, if your mind is anything like mine, it is crammed full of worthless information. Stocked up from early childhood on up. Did you know? Because I do. Did you know that the, it's impossible to play baseball for the New York Yankees and wear a single digit number? They have all been retired. They've all been retired. Starting with Billy Martin at one, Jeter at two, Ruth at three, Gehrig at four, DiMaggio at five, Torrey at six. Mantle at seven, even though when he came in the first time as a rookie, they gave him six. He couldn't hit the high fastball, got demoted. Someone else took six. He came back at seven. Eight is retired twice. That's how incredible the New York Yankees are. Bill Dickey and Yogi Berra. Nine is Maris. Then you keep going. You can hit 10 with Rizzuto. The the, uh, teens open up a little bit, but then you hit 15 and 16 with Munson and Ford and on and on. 20s open up. We're hoping 22 is locked up for 10 more years. Worthless information. I don't plan on playing for the Yankees. I don't know that any of you do. And they'll give you a number that's available. You don't need to memorize them. The worst part as we age is that we usually don't forget the useless stuff. Somehow it sticks with us. The addresses, the phone numbers, the retired numbers. We start forgetting where we put our keys and our wallet, and then even worse, when your wife starts trying to attach air tags to all of your things, personal story, that's the first clue that you have a problem. I think with something so serious like we're looking at this morning, the riches in Romans and the series that Scott's been leading us through, we're, we're studying, we're hearing, we're reading all these wonderful, significant eternal truths. These are things that transform our lives for time and eternity. And they are the things that need to be taking up such valuable storage on these primitive hard drives we call brains. And so that's what we get to do this morning. And let's look at our text. We'll read it through, and then we'll get to to talk about it. What then shall we say to these things? Verse 31. If God is for us, Who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. And we are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I want to ask you two questions that I ask people on a regular basis. The first one is, if you were to die today, It's a real positive spin on things. But if you were to die today on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being 100% assurance, how sure are you that you're going to heaven? 
The second question, if you were to die today and you stood before God and he were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? If either of those questions stumped you or caused you pause the way they did when someone first asked them of me, our passage this morning will answer both of those questions. You can know with 100% confidence where you'll go when this earthly life ends. Because our passage this morning we just read is a celebration of the security of the believer's relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul's been rehearsing the blessings. We've been rehearsing the blessings of these riches in Romans that come to the believer in Christ. Paul's been covering it since the beginning of the book of Romans. We're here at the end of chapter 8. And in many ways, this passage is the climactic summary of the first eight chapters of Romans and all the blessings that we enjoy. If there's one thing Paul wants to make sure of, it's that every believer knows that they can be certain of final vindication. If you are eternally secured by the love of God in Christ Jesus, no matter how deep and dark the valleys get in this life, you can be sure that no tribulation, no trial, No testing can shake you free from the grip that Jesus Christ has on your eternal soul. Now, our text, as we read it, divides into two parts. 31 through 34 is the first judicial part, and 35 through 39 is the more relational part. The first part's a judicial argument of our legal standing before God. It's almost a, a courtroom back and forth. There's no persuasive lawyer There's no surprise evidence that can be presented in God's righteous courtroom that can ever ever, ever overturn his verdict of declaring you as a believer eternally secure and eternally saved. And then the second passage that starts at, at 35 is this poetic celebration of every believer's victory over every form of darkness in this life and the life to come. And the basis for both of these sections is the love of God in Christ Jesus, which he mentions three times in just this short paragraph. So we'll just walk through it verse by verse. Verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? What then then shall we say to these things? What these things? These things are the the spiritual blessings. These are the riches in Romans that we've been enjoying for the past few weeks. And they're all of the uh, blessings that Paul recounts in uh, chapters 1 through 8 of the book of Romans. And then he uses a delicate phrase, if God is for us, who can be against us? He makes a strong assertion there, God is for us. That's a dangerous phrase, and it's a dangerous statement. And it has been used historically by religious fanatics to justify many actions that once accomplished prove that God was far from on their side. But there's two things to note in the declaration, God is for us, who can be against us? And the first thing to note, it's important to remember that for the Christian, people are never the enemy. Verse 31 is a a declaration of vindication for the believer It is not a declaration of war on an unbelieving world. 2 Timothy 2 puts it this way. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. So Paul exhorts the young pastor Timothy to remember this, and this text commands us to be gentle and kind to those who don't believe, not because we're not at war, but because we're not at war with them. That's the reminder Paul gives. Evangelism is a rescue mission helping people escape from the snare of the devil. They've been trapped, and they've been duped. They are not the enemy. They are the prey. So that's the first thing. The second thing is the Christian is engaged in spiritual warfare. 
Spiritual warfare requires spiritual weapons, not earthly weapons, not physical weapons, not political weapons, and certainly not social media weapons. Ephesians 6, 12 says this, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So, just a quick reminder, God is for us, people aren't the enemy. However, it's a dangerous statement, but it, has, it is just as dangerous to avoid using the statement that God is for us. Because if the gospel tells us anything, it's the fact that God is for sinners who are the objects of his love in Christ Jesus. That's what the gospel declares. If God is for us, or literally because God is at work on our behalf, who could possibly thwart his determined will? This does not mean that we will not face difficulties in this life. This does not mean that we will not face opposition in living for Jesus Christ. When we begin the journey of living for Jesus and no longer living for ourselves, we immediately start swimming upstream from the rest of the world. Opposition to our spiritual progression will be varied and will oftentimes be intense. And what Paul means is that when God is working in you and when God is working through you and when God is working on your behalf, behalf the greatest difficulty this life can throw at you, the most wicked opposition that takes its stand against you is of no concern to you. You're encouraged you're supported, you're promised victory because of the love of God in Christ Jesus. And so you can be sure that nothing's going to thwart that. And he immediately goes on to that in verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? In this courtroom setting, now Paul now states, his third straight rhetorical question of the passage. If God has given us the greatest gift in his son, that's a sure promise that we will receive every spiritual blessing that comes along with salvation, every spiritual blessing that he's enumerated through the book of Romans. And it echoes the theme that we looked at last week with Scott in Romans chapter five, but God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. The wonderful truth of the gospel is that we have a representative who pleads for mercy on our behalf in the face of the wrath of God. And it's not because we deserve it. It's not because of all the good things we've done. No, in fact, our representative enters a guilty plea. Guilty is charged. But our representative pleads for mercy on the grounds of his righteous action, his perfect righteous life, and his sacrificial death on the cross. Dying a death that we deserve to die. Our sin as sinners must be atoned for. It must be reckoned with. Atonement is necessary for every one of us. And atonement is necessary because we've sinned against God. We've fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, and we deserve God's just wrath. Notice in our verse, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. It's important to remember that the God of Scripture is not a primitive God. Not a primitive God who demands a blood sacrifice to appease his wrath. God's wrath is not arbitrary. God's wrath is not wicked. God doesn't fly off the handle. God's wrath is not the result of him losing it on inferior creatures who keep frustrating with him. It's not unpredictable. It's not vengeful. God's wrath is controlled, and it's the focused and necessary indictment of all evil. God's wrath is the inevitable and necessary reaction of a holy God to sin. Therefore, God's wrath is sure to fall on every sinner. 
But God became flesh and dwelt among us and died in our place to honor his justice and pour out his love. And that's why we run to the cross. That's why Romans repeatedly runs to the cross. And the theme of Romans is righteousness that we get at the cross because it's only on the cross of Christ that we discover the end of sin and the end of death because it's only on the cross that God is able to destroy all evil without destroying us. It's there that he begins to make all things new. And it's God's love that is clearly seen through the fact that it is God himself who initiates the offering through the blood of his son. God's love and God's wrath meet in the atonement and meet at the cross of Christ. Christ did forever what the blood of bulls and goats could never do. Christ's death atoned for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. We cannot atone for our own sins, but what we could never do, Christ accomplished for us. As Peter puts it, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. And then Paul in 2 Corinthians said, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. It's at the cross of Christ that we go from objects of wrath to children of God. To have Christ is to have eternal life. Verse 33. Another question. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. So it's a rhetorical question that he very quickly answers. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Therefore, when God justifies, no one can bring a charge against God's elect. And justification is the legal declaration in which God pardons the sinner of all his sins and accepts and accounts the sinner as righteous in his sight. And justification happens the moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ. You become justified. It is God who justifies. So God is just by nature. Man is unjust by nature. So the question is, how is it possible for God to justify someone so unholy and so unrighteous? That's the mystery of the gospel. We must first understand how unjust man is, and then we must first understand how just God is. This is not a small chasm. It cannot be easily bridged with sin management and behavior modification and cleaning up your act. This kind of separation can only be repaired. This kind of gap can only be bridged by God himself. So what does the Bible mean that man is unjust? I've already said we're we're all sinners. And it's because of Adam's sin, the first man, that we are separated from God. Once sin entered, entered the world, the world broke. It's not how it should be, in case you haven't noticed. And mankind broke. People are not the way they should be. Romans 5.12 told us, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. The Bible says that in our natural condition, we are born spiritually stillborn, dead in our trespasses and sins. The Bible describes us as children of wrath, enemies of God, under condemnation, held captive by Satan to do his will, blind to the beauty of Jesus Christ and the glory of the gospel. Our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. We do not seek God. We do not understand God, and we love the darkness rather than the light. We suppress the truth of God in unrighteousness, and our minds are hostile toward God. For we do not subject ourselves to the law of God, nor are we even able to do so. This was, this was all enumerated two weeks ago when Scott walked us through and looked at the indictment in Romans chapter 3. We're totally corrupt. Not utterly corrupt, but we're totally corrupt. We're not as bad as we 
could be all the time, thankfully, but we are bent in the wrong direction. By nature, we seek to please ourselves. And as soon as sin entered the picture, we quickly began to cover our sin to, and to blame shift whenever we were called out. Sin's power and influence affects us totally. Body, soul, mind, will, emotions, our heart, we're wholly corrupt. And sin has ravaged every area of our lives. We sin because we are sinners. And no one has escaped the corruption. Romans 3 tells us, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That is the beauty of unjust and unrighteous man in all of our corruption. And in contrast to being unjust, God is just. And when we say that he's just, we mean that he is perfectly righteous in his treatment of his creation and his creatures. God shows no partiality. He's commanded that no one be oppressed or abused, and he promises vengeance on the oppressor and the abuser. Later in Romans 12, he says, Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. God is just in rewarding righteous deeds. Hebrews 6 tells us, For God is not unjust, so as to forget your work and the love which you've shown toward his name in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. And God is also just in punishing unrighteousness. Colossians 3 says, For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. Psalm 89 tells us that righteousness and justice are the foundations of the very throne of God, and loving kindness and truth go before him. So the question is, with this unlimited power, can't God just overlook sin? Can't there be another solution than the death of his son? Can't he just grade on the curve? If God were to behave in such a way, it would be immediately inconsistent with his character. The moment he overlooks a single sin, he immediately sacrifices his justice. The process of divine forgiveness isn't simply God winking at our sin and letting us pass like some bouncer being selective about who gets into the nightclub. And we looked at this last week in Romans 3, 21, when he said, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness Because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Human sin must be atoned for. God's holiness demands it. And God's glory is trampled underfoot by sinning man. God has been belittled. And then rather than instantly killing sinners to vindicate himself and declare his justice, he vindicated himself by sacrificing his son, making himself the justifier, making himself the righteous judge who can at one time declare us fully guilty of our sin and at the same time declare us fully pardoned because of what Christ accomplished for us on the cross. He could have sent his son to punish and capture and commit every sinner to eternal hell in order to vindicate himself and declare his justice. But he didn't. It says in John, indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world through him might be saved. And Peter says this, for Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. We need a mediator. That chasm is too great. And the point of the atonement 
is that a just man died for unjust mankind. So justification is the act of the supreme judge of the universe declaring the sinful and unjust man just. But what are the grounds for God making such a declaration? Well, it's imputation. The great declaration of John the Baptist, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. As the Jewish priest put his hands on the scapegoat as the sacrifice for sin, Jesus takes upon himself the sins of the world. So much so that Peter says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life, inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Our sin goes to Jesus, declaring us innocent. Christ's righteousness comes to us, declaring us righteous. A transaction takes place, a real transaction and a real union, so much so that the Bible now says you are in Christ. That's your present condition. Christ is my righteousness, not just because he died, but because he lives and because he's seated at God's right hand and he is right at this moment interceding for us. The good news is that you can be at the same time sinner and justified through Jesus Christ. Therefore, no one can bring a charge against us. Verse 34, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. So these two verses put together, 33 and 34, Paul brings us into the courtroom on the final day of judgment. You're on trial. Will any star witness be called that could eternally separate you from God? Will the gavel drop and God's declaration of innocence and justification and forgiveness will be changed to guilty? Is it possible that you be sentenced to eternal torment? And he says, no. There's no one that could be called that could bring a charge against God's elect. The accuser, Satan himself, can't. Earthly enemies can't. And not even our own sins will be able to condemn us. Now, the question, if you're thinking truly about this, and especially for the first time, is how can this be? It's important to note that we'll never be condemned, not just because of what Christ has done for us as our Savior, but what he will do as our judge. Corinthians says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. The one who justifies the believer by his blood and freed us from condemnation, will be the same one to give the final verdict. That's the security we have as believers. Verse 35. And who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? So verse 35 starts this new section. Left behind is the legal declaration of God being for us. And instead, the emphasis now shifts to the love of Christ and the love of God. It's this personal and relational love that give us confidence to believe he will keep us forever. Scott talked about this last week. It's, it's the sacrifice of his son that God's love is preeminently shown. In Romans 5, 8, God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God's love is not an emotion, it's an action. And it's an action that is most clearly seen in the cross of Christ. It's interesting to note that as you read through that list in 35 of all those difficulties, that most of those are all found in Paul's personal journal, journal of wrongs suffered that you can read about in 2 Corinthians 11 and 12. There's no pressure, there's no outward distress there's no inner distress there's no persecution there's no lack of resources and even death itself will not be able to separate us from christ's love for us 
And then he brings Psalm 44 in as kind of a little interruption to the flow, as it is written, verse 36, For your sake we are being killed all the day long, and we are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. So Paul stops to interject an Old Testament reality as if to a confirmation, as Calvin put it, that it's no new thing for the Lord to permit his saints to be undeservedly exposed to the cruelty of the ungodly. And then verse 37, know in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Paul wants to emphasize that the believer doesn't just win in the end. It's an absolute blowout. It's not even close. It isn't even close, and not because God makes us all powerful warriors, but because the most powerful son now stands in the gap, and we get to claim the victory that Jesus won on our behalf. So there is a totality of victory that promises that nothing in this life can drive a wedge between the believer and Christ's love for us. And that's most clearly evidenced by his death on the cross. And then he concludes this section, 38 and 39. He says, I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We want to be careful in a list like that not to give the text more precision maybe than Paul intended, but he is he's simply using these contrasting pairs to show that there's no extreme in any direction of all these categories that will be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. He starts with human existence, death and life, and then to the spirit world, angels and rulers, which would be the, the demons, to present and future circumstances, and then finally spatial, no height nor depth. There's nowhere you can go in all the created universe where you will suddenly find yourself separated from the love of God. The love of God, as this section concludes, is, is in many ways indescribable. It's, it's uh, imp- difficult to understand. It's kind of like describing heaven where you won't have the ability to sin. We're so marred by our own sin, it's difficult to imagine living life without the ability to sin. In the same way, it's difficult to understand what true love really is when all we have to compare it to is what we experience as human love. We cannot fully comprehend God. We're the finite studying the infinite, and we only get the slivers of his majesty that he offers to us. So his love is even more foreign. We can know what God chooses to reveal about himself because he's a God of revelation. He's given us his word, which tells us of his character, and it tells us of his love. And it tells us his love is steadfast. It doesn't waver. And that God is a covenant-keeping God. When God initiates the covenant, when God initiates the blessing, he will see it through. So when he offers us his love, We know we can stand by his word because he operates for his own sake and for his own glory. And we can rejoice this morning that his love toward us has nothing to do with our lovableness. There is no one who can sin their way out of the reach of God's love. I don't know how how friends you are this morning, either, either physically or spiritually or mentally, but there is no distance that we can get away from God's love that his God his love can't reach us his offer of forgiveness is extended this morning not because you deserve it we're not gathered here as people rejoicing in the fact that we deserved to be loved by God it's because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life and the love of God is to be lived and manifested more than it's simply to be learned and and filed away with all that data 
Because when it's lived, it overflows into a reciprocal love for God and as a result of that, a a love for people. When Jesus was asked, what's the foremost commandment, which is a great question, he gives a great answer. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. When we experience the love of God, our life begins to, through the power of the Holy Spirit, overflow in a love for God and a love for people. And the love of God bestows on us the greatest gift we could ever receive, which is God himself and right relationship with him. So we started with two questions. Let's end with two questions. On a scale of one to 10, 10 being 100% sure, how sure are you that you're going to heaven? Our passage today tells us that you can be 100% sure of where you're going when you die. It has nothing to do with what you've done and everything to do with what Christ did for you. And the second question, if you were to die today and stand before God, and he was ask you, why should I let you into heaven, what would you say? I remember my first response to that question when I first heard it. And I didn't say it out loud because I didn't think it was appropriate. But I'll say it out loud now. I thought he shouldn't. I don't think he should let me in. And I was closer to the truth at that point than I had ever been before. He shouldn't let me in. There's nothing I did to earn or deserve heaven. It's only because of what Christ accomplished for me. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the riches of Romans. We thank you for almost any passage in this book we can read about who you are, what you have done, what you have promised, and what you will do. We thank you for the confidence that brings to us. We thank you for the security that we gain. But we thank you most of all for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It is only through his offering that we as unjust people become justified in your sight. It's only through his sacrifice and the offering of himself that we receive the righteousness that's required to be in your presence. If you had not initiated, we would have never turned to you. So we're grateful that you saw us in our sin and you sent a Savior. And Father, if there's anyone here who has not received you, who has not considered these eternal truths, I pray that they would not delay. We know sin and death are our mortal enemies. If sin doesn't get us in this life, death will always get us in the end. And so there's a day coming, a day of judgment. And as we read this passage, we can rejoice at a day of judgment, knowing that we will come before the the judgment seat of Christ and receive not the condemnation, but the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ himself when we believe and receive you. So, Father, would you do that work in hearts that are distant from you? Would you take out hearts of stone and give them hearts of flesh to respond to your love? We thank you for the opportunity to gather, to rejoice in all the goodness and all the blessings of Romans, all the goodness and all the blessings that you give us, and the privilege we have to go about this week full of truth and ready to share. We thank you that we can... Rejoice now as we sing praises to your name. Amen.